only four episodes into the season, and the Amphibia team has already given us one of the best episodes of the entire series thus far. Season 2, Episode 4, Coraler's Pass and Toadcatcher gave us a knee-slapping Sprig and Polly adventure, accompanied by some extremely fascinating antagonists, a potential tease of Anne's life back home, and major development in both death and momentum for Sasha and Grimes' storyline. Now folks, it's no secret that Toadcatcher was the standout episode for this week, so while I'll touch on the tidbits I found most interesting with Coiler's Pass, the real meat of this analysis lies with our villainous escapades. Let's not waste any more time and dive right in. And of course, spoiler warning, if you are not caught up with Amphibia, please go catch up and then come back, unless you don't care about spoilers, in that case, I can't really stop you, but you've been warned. Starting with Coraler's Pass, one thing that stuck out as odd to me was in the very beginning of this episode, if not odd, just interesting. In the season premiere, Hop Hop mentioned that it would take two weeks to arrive to Newtopia. However, here, they remark it's been two weeks of nonstop arguing between Polly and Sprig on the road, and saying that she can't bear another two weeks. However, this could likely just be referring to the two weeks it will take them to travel home, and in general, I'm sure it was just meant as a throwaway line. But I don't know, it caught my attention. A previous episode of this season, I can't remember if it was within episode 2 or 3, remarked that things were kind of slowing down for the planters, but that could have easily been momentarily. Either way, it's not like this was a show trying to tell us that we still have a ways to go, as we're only one episode away from the big arrival not counting this week. We learn in this episode that Sprig and Polly can do perfect impressions of not just each other, which would already make sense due to how often they're around each other, but of other people as well, such as the axolotl twins that they have to escape from later on. I think this family trait will come back into play later in this season, in a pivotal moment where circumstances require them to impersonate the voice of any of the major characters they're due to encounter. General Yunnan, Lady Olivia, King Andreas, or maybe even Marcy. The purpose of the Coraler's Pass proclaims itself to be a road to reconciliation for wary travel mates, which has me thinking this may not be the only appearance of the pass or its inhabitants. Why? Well, even though the path served to aid Sprig and Polly in this episode, its description sounds like it would be a perfect fit for Anne and Sasha. It's not out of the realm of possibility that eventually, even if it's not this season, the two can wind up in this pass, having to correct their strained relationship in order to survive. I wouldn't even be surprised if Marcy is thrown into the mix. Hop Hop cannot handle the silence between him and Anne, and desperately tries to force small talk in his own nosy way, which was a situation I could relate to from both sides. I can dig some peace and quiet, not really wanting to conversate non-stop, and just taking a moment to absorb the good vibes. On the other hand, I can understand that silence isn't always golden. It can be awkward, even if you're comfortable with your traveling mates. I swear, these are the small things that Amphibia does to make it that much more relatable. Throwing in scenarios that run in the background, that people can experience a plethora of times in their lives, just like Spriggs packing dilemmas in Handy Ann. It's a universal relatability, something that you can relate to as a kid, teen, or adult. Moments that really make Amphibia a good family show to sit down and watch with the whole crew. Now, if only if this current Disney TVA block of Big City Greens, Amphibia, and the Owl House was simulcast on Disney+, Plus, so more families can engage with these shows every week as they air. Come on, it makes sense! No, let go of me! I have to tell the masses the truth will be revealed! It's interesting to note that within Hop Hop's attempt at small talk, which leads him to ask about a potential boyfriend for Anne back home, she is quick to kick him off the wagon, which happens again at the end of this episode. There's a solid implication that Anne has or had a romantic interest back at home that she does not want to talk about at all. Oddly enough, I have two theories for what this could be. Scenario A, Anne had a relationship with a guy she really liked that Sasha and Marcy talked her out of, pressuring her into finding a guy who could be more quote-unquote socially acceptable, and essentially being forced to cut off this hypothetical boyfriend. Or scenario B, Anne had a typical crush on a popular kid, but competed with Sasha for his affection and ultimately lost, or at least felt like she was losing before Amphibia whisked them away. Either way, 
I do think this is planting a seed for a future story. And as it involves Anne's life on Earth, I think her toxic friendships with Sasha and Marcy factored into why she's so hesitant to talk about it. But hey, I guess in general, people can be hesitant about talking about their love life to family. I, for one, definitely was too anxious to tell my mom about my current girlfriend until we were actually dating. And ah, uh, come on, we all know how adults can be. Two young people sitting next to each other? They're totally dating! But with all that wrapped up, Let's move on to Toad Catcher. Now, I'm looking at my notes and I cannot stress this first point enough. Let's go! All right, but on a serious note, since the events of Reunion, life has not been kind to Sasha or Grime. Sasha has doubled down and immersed herself in constant training, channeling her confusing emotions, especially her anger over falling out with Anne, and more so, her anger at the planters for taking Anne from her. And I say that with huge quotation marks. Taking out their dummy replicas with ease. Although, she spared the poly dummy, so, you know, that was kinda nice. But of course she also spared Anne's dummy, knocking it to the ground and drawing her sword, which is pretty much the exact same move she pulled on Anne in Reunion, without the fear of Anne retaliating and dropping a fresh scar. Grime, on the other hand, has fallen into a much more blatant depression. Due to the destruction of Toad Tower and his abandonment of the premises, he's been labeled as a fugitive of Utopia, the majority of his army abandoning him as a result. He's grown a beard, he's going through cans of alcohol or bog grog, he's binging Suspicion Island off Sasha's phone, he's even letting Sasha stray into danger, giving her absolutely no support. He has a minimal drive to protect her, as displayed with the stage jambo and their battle with Yunnan, which is a complete 180 from the end of Reunion, when he stopped her from plummeting to certain death. Aside from Sasha, he still has Percy and Braddock, who have a fling going on? That's cute, but you definitely get what this episode was hammering home. Grime is a shell of himself. Well, until the end. Grimes' fall is only magnified by the revelation that he used to be a famed gladiator. Assumably, this led to his promotion as the leader of the Toads, employed by Newtopia and King Andreas, which has me thinking the Newts want the Toads to oppress the frogs. This is the enforced order, which means we have a recipe for disaster when the frog responsible for other frogs rebelling against the toads comes knocking at Newtopia's door, hoping to seek answers on the Calamity Box, something that is sure to be coveted. And I feel like this also kind of fleshes out the hierarchy of all the frogs in Amphibia. The frogs in the valley that you can find in the likes of Wartwood are meant to live as townsfolk. They simply work, provide labor, and start a family. That's all that's expected from them. And as we see with Hop Hop, being anything exceptional can lead to danger. That, my friends, is the domino effect. However, the role of the Toads appear to be muscle heads. They're kind of meant to be army fodder. If Toads aren't picking fights, they're doing it wrong. And that leaves the Newts for the top of the chain. Hell, they have a city named after them. We still don't know much from the Newts, aside from their proclaimed wisdom, but I definitely have a feeling that there's some propaganda at foot. Grimes' bounty coincides with the arrival of your new favorite character, General Yunnan, who, just in case you somehow missed it, carries the titles of the Scourge of the Sand Wars, Defeater of Ragnar the Wretched, and the youngest Newt to ever achieve the rank of General in the Great Newtopian Army. I did all of her poses while saying that. Each of these titles back up with a medal. One features a pyramid surrounded by sand dunes. Another sports a sword through a skull. Hinting this wasn't just a defeat, it was definitely a death. And a Newtopian flag on the last medal to complete the trilogy. Now proud is definitely a word that suits Yunnan. Her talents and achievements giving her quite an ego, on top of her love for Newtopia instilling a sense of superiority. Hell, she rocks the flag on her back as her cape. I get that it's just likely a cape that's forced into the Newtopian emblem, but y you know, you guys get what I'm saying. She's confident, cunning, and strategic, shown by her deception towards Percy and Braddock to locate Grime. She's a wee bit aggressive, some may say vicious, as seen of her approach to just about everyone she encountered in this episode. And how can we ignore the plethora of JoJo and Team Rocket poses? Mwah! Beautiful, 10 out of 10! Also, doesn't need to be said, but she's strong. Like, really strong. 
Flying solo as an army slowed her down, with whatever implications your brain infers from there on out. You can even argue a dose of insecurity with how boastful she is. Irritated that she wasn't recognized by the many civilians of the pub, on top of Sasha and Grime, quick to resort to violence with her sharp wolverine claws. Her pride and potential insecurity is where her weakness is highlighted, too caught up in establishing her greatness, leaving herself open for an opponent to swoop in for victory. Shifting gears back to Sasha and Grime, a great moment that illustrated the Zuko and Iroh vibes I've mentioned in the past was Grime calling out the motivation for Sasha's sudden obsession with training, which is her falling out with Anne. Now that Anne has stood up to Sasha, they can't go back to the dynamic that Sasha established for them. If they are ever to reconcile, Sasha has to reevaluate herself and how she treats the people in her life. Something that she's not ready to do. However, Grime is already inspiring one big change in Sasha, as she's finally looking out for someone other than herself, Grime. With them being her only real friend left in this world, or alternate dimension, she finds it important to stay by his side and defend him when necessary. Within all this toxicity and mayhem, one can argue that's at least one viable lesson Sasha is learning that can hopefully one day make her a better friend to Anne. The fight scene between Sasha, Sorta Grime, and Yunan was spectacular. Kudos to the storyboard artist and a director for this episode, Joe Johnston, on top of the animation studio who handled this episode overseas. Everyone knocked it out of the park, and the influx of action scenes this season does so much to reward the viewer for their investment while building up momentum for a much bigger payoff. Sasha's sword shattered one of Yunnan's claws. Although this is a great testament to Sasha's development as a warrior, I can't help but to consider all the crazy shit Yunnan did earlier for claws. So you know I'm thinking there's some calamity shenanigans afoot. We didn't see Sasha's eyes during that moment. While again, this could have easily been of her own accord. Who knows, maybe there could have been an eye glow or maybe a scar glow. We also have a last name revealed, Sasha Waybright. A last name that in inspires hope for a redemption arc, but alas, she must travel her own path. A path that shifted by the end of this episode. Reigniting his drive. Thank god they didn't drag this out over multiple episodes. Grime declares a new mission. Foregoing his allegiance to the kingdom of Newtopia, Grime leaves behind his ambition to reclaim the valley in his glory. Instead, setting his sights on Newtopia itself, wanting to overthrow the king with a new army ringing in an era of a toad-ruled amphibia. So, we can assume this mission will be broken up into smaller goals. One, assembling a new army, one that may not even be comprised solely of toads, if an allegiance with the frogs will benefit Grime, and that would be a good way to introduce a few of the Wartwood villagers into the season. Two, well, train that army, unless their strengths speak for themselves. Three, infiltrate Newtopia. And four, fight like Hell, it feels like the three girls brought to Amphibia all have their allegiance. Anne's with the frogs, Sasha's with the toads, and because she's already in Utopia decked out in gear, yeah, we know Marcy's going to be there for the newts. All three destined to converge in bossing, I mean Newtopia. All three, Newtopia. I definitely don't have Avatar vibes, but that's only a compliment. That can only be a compliment. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Amphibia Season 2. I was loving this season already, but now I can't wait to see what's next. But as always, these are just our thoughts and we want to hear yours. What do you think? How did you feel about this fantastic episode of Amphibia? Love it? Hate it? Need more General Yunnan in your life? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below or tweet your thoughts at RontableVids. And for my own thoughts, you can find me at Fox. We are also on Instagram. Help Dentable grow by either becoming a member of this channel or supporting us over at Patreon. Link in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please do a like and subscribe to the Roundtable for more great cartoon content. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have an awesome day. Ultra Vox, signing out.